Tonight, hope on the horizon. Israel surprises with tentative agreement to Biden's Gaza plan, reiterating their focus on retrieving hostages from the West Bank. Nearing the end, India continues to see thousands turn out to polls as the final leg of the election begin wrapping up with Modi in a confident lead. Taking aside, Waters mulled support for Trump following his legal battles despite the court chaos. There seems to be no slowing down on the campaign trail. To the moon, the far side of the moon now conquered by Chinese efforts as the uncrewed mission sees a successful touchdown. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Verna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening, you're joining us on World News Tonight this Monday evening. With the start of the week, we have a number of key stories to update you on. And we begin with a very hopeful update on the Israel-Palestine conflict. An aide to Prime Minister Netanyahu confirmed that Israel accepted a framework deal for winding down the Gaza war advanced by President Biden, saying it's not a good deal, but they dearly want the hostages released. Thousands of people expressed their support for Israel Sunday in New York, while thousands of others backed the Palestinians from Karachi. In an interview with Britain's Sunday Times, Netanyahu's chief foreign policy advisor Ophir Falk said Biden's proposal was a deal we agreed to. It's not a good deal, but we dearly want the hostages released, all of them. Biden said the first phase entails a truce and the return of some hostages held by Hamas, after which the sides would negotiate on an open-ended cessation of hostilities for a second phase in which remaining live captives would go free. Israel's defense minister Yoav Gallant said on Sunday that Israel would not accept Hamas continuing to rule Gaza at any stage during the process to wind down the war, and that it was examining alternatives to the Islamist group. Hamas has provisionally welcomed the Biden initiative. Though a senior official from the group, Sami Abu Zuri, said on Sunday that Hamas is too big to be bypassed or sidelined by Netanyahu or Biden. White House National Security spokesperson John Kirby told Sunday that if Hamas agrees to the deal to end the Gaza war, the U.S. expects Israel to also accept the plan. The war began October 7th when Hamas fighters stormed across the border fence into Israel killing 1,200 people and taking more than 250 hostages, according to Israeli tallies. In the ensuing Israeli assault that has laid waste to much of the impoverished and besieged coastal enclave, more than 36,000 Palestinians have been killed, Gaza medical officials say. Israel says 290 of its troops have died in the fighting. Meanwhile, in our region, the voting process in India is nearing a close. As an early exit poll summary projected that Prime Minister Narendra Modi's BJP-led alliance will win a majority in the general election. Indians voted in searing summer heat on Saturday in what was the final phase of the world's biggest election. Incumbent Prime Minister Narendra Modi is seeking a rare third term in a poll focused on inequality and religion. An early exit poll summary by the NDTV news channel on Saturday said Modi and his Bharatiya Janata Party-led alliance is projected to win a majority in the election. But exit polls have a patchy record in India and have often got election outcomes wrong. More than 100 million people were registered to vote in the seventh phase of the election, with more than 1 billion eligible to cast their ballots overall. But scorching summer temperatures with unusually severe heat waves have compounded voter fatigue. Temperatures reached 118 degrees Fahrenheit in many voting areas on Saturday. For voters in the majority Hindu country of 1.4 billion people, like Preeti Bhatia, joblessness and inflation are key concerns. Modi's Hindu nationalist BJP is battling an opposition alliance of two dozen parties, led by Rahul Gandhi's Congress. But the BJP has run into a spirited campaign by the opposition India Alliance, sowing some doubts about how close the race might be. Modi's re-election campaign has targeted the Congress, accusing it of favouring India's minority Muslims, which the party denies. 
The opposition has largely campaigned on affirmative action and saving the constitution from what they call Modi's dictatorial rule, an allegation the BJP denies. Full election results are due to be announced on Tuesday. And still in Asia, we see some espionage allegations. China has accused UK secret intelligence service MI6 of recruiting Chinese state employees as spies. China's Ministry of State Security said MI6 operatives turned a Chinese man identified only by his surname Wang and his wife's surname Zhu against Beijing. Both worked in core confidential departments in a Chinese state agency. The ministry alleged that the MI6 started cultivating Mr. Wang when he went to the UK for his studies in 2015 under a Sino-British exchange program. The ministry alleged the operatives took special care of him in the UK, such as by inviting him to dinners and tours to better understand his interests and weaknesses. This comes just over a month after the UK charged two men with spying for China. Beijing and several Western countries have increasingly been trading accusations of espionage. China did not reveal how it uncovered the case involving Mr. Wang and Mr. Zhou, saying only that it came after a thorough investigation. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has accused Russia and China of attempting to undermine his upcoming global peace summit in Switzerland. He said Russia was trying to dissuade other states from attending the event and that China was working to do this as well. For more on that, we have up there in a world new special correspondent Minoli Zagaria from Kursk in Russia. Yes, Sanavi. Speaking at an Asian security forum, he also said there were elements of Russia's weaponry that come from China. China says it does not side with either side of the Ukraine war, a position that has been increasingly questioned, particularly by the US. Beijing is accused of aiding Moscow by sending components for weapons. It is also seen as propping up the Russian economy by purchasing vast quantities of oil and gas, softening the impact of Western sanctions. Mr. Zelensky made a surprise appearance at the Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore attended by defense chiefs from around the world including US Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin and Chinese Defense Minister Dong Zhen. Russia has not been invited and China is not attending. Back to you Sanovi. Thank you. There was other in a world deal special correspondent Minoli Sagaria from Kursk in Russia. And on a diplomatic front, the defense chiefs of South Korea, the US and Japan agreed to launch a trilateral multi-domain exercise dubbed the Freedom Edge. The agreement comes amid joint efforts to bolster security cooperation against North Korea's continued threats. South Korea's Defense Ministry announced Sunday that Seoul, Washington and Tokyo agreed to launch a trilateral multi-domain exercise this summer in a move to strengthen security cooperation against Pyongyang's evolving threats. The ministry said the agreement was reached between the defense chiefs of the three countries during three-way talks on the sidelines of the Shangri-La Dialogue Security Conference in Singapore over the weekend. Dubbed Freedom Edge, it will be held across a number of domains including cyber, air, maritime and underwater. The exercise takes its name from bilateral exercises the U.S. holds with its two Asian allies, Freedom Shield with South Korea and Keen Edge with Japan. No further details of the planned three-way exercise, including the timing or location, were provided. While the three allies have previously held joint maritime and air drills, this summer's Freedom Edge would mark the first exercise of its kind after their leaders agreed on various efforts to deter North Korea's nuclear and missile threats at Camp David last year. During the three-way talks between the defense chiefs over the weekend, they agreed to come up with a framework document for trilateral security cooperation efforts by the end of this year while also agreeing to optimize their system to share North Korean missile warning data in real time. The announcement from the ministry also comes amid North Korea's recent provocations, including several short-range ballistic missiles being launched last week, as well as the sending of hundreds of balloons carrying trash and other waste. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side.
And on to the road to the White House tonight. Donald Trump said he would accept home confinement or jail time after his historic conviction by a New York jury last week, but that it would be tough for the public to accept. The Republican presidential candidate said that he's not sure the public would stand for it, speaking of a breaking point. A newly convicted felon, former President Donald Trump cheered, attending an Ultimate Fighting Championship event in New Jersey Saturday night, posting his appearance on TikTok. Trump again on the attack since a New York jury found him guilty on 34 counts related to falsifying business records, promising revenge and railing against the judicial system. My revenge will be success, and I mean that. But it's awfully hard when you see what they've done. These people are so evil. When asked about the possibility of facing house arrest or even jail time, Trump said this. I think it would be tough for the public to take. You know, at a certain point, there's a breaking point. Democrats responding. This is another dangerous appeal to violence, and it is yet another reason why Americans are going to decide they don't want a convicted felon in the Oval Office. Legal experts say it's highly unlikely Trump will receive jail time at his sentencing in July. Trump's attorneys saying they plan to appeal by arguing the judge overseeing the case was biased. A new poll showing Americans are divided over Trump's conviction, 50% saying they think the verdict was correct. But almost as many, 49%, say they think Trump should end his 2024 presidential campaign over the result. Meanwhile, there is history being made across the border as Mexico's ruling party declared Claudia Sheinbaum the winner of the president election by a large margin, putting her on course to be the country's first woman president, inheriting the project of her mentor, Andres Manuel López Obrador. The head of the ruling Morena party, Mario Delgado, told supporters in Mexico City that Sheinbaum had won by a, quote, very large margin. One exit poll gave her a landslide 56% of the vote. Mexico's largest ever elections have also been its most violent in modern history, with the killing of some 38 candidates. On Sunday, two people were killed at a polling station in Puebla State. The deadly violence has stoked concerns about the threat posed to democracy by warring drug cartels. More people have been killed during the mandate of outgoing leader Andres Manuel López Obrador than during any other administration in Mexico's modern history. Shane Baum, who has convincingly led in opinion polls over her main competitor, Xochitl Galvez, will be tasked with confronting organized crime violence and reviving a sluggish economy. And a victory for her would represent a major step for Mexico, a country known for its macho culture. The winner is set to begin a six-year term on August 1st. The weather continues to cause chaos across the globe. Heavy rains and floods hit parts of Germany. Officials in one region have declared a state of emergency. There is also concern about heavy flooding in Italy. In both countries, hundreds of people were advised to leave their homes as rivers threatened to burst their banks. Trapped by the river, these three young people, all in their 20s, try as best they can to resist being swept away. Called by local residents, the fire brigade attempted to rescue them with a rope from a crane. But were unsuccessful. Early Friday, the group were reported missing. The incident occurred in the village of Premariaco in northern Italy, which was on yellow alert for flooding. The part of the Natizone River that is off limits because it is known to flood seemed calm when they arrived, but they found themselves trapped within minutes. Over in southern Germany, where heavy rains have turned streets into rivers, authorities have urged residents to follow evacuation orders. Helicopters were used to rescue those trapped in their homes. Some have seen their entire properties damaged. Similar scenes here in eastern Switzerland, where heavy rains caused a river to flood. Dozens of homes have been hit. According to scientists, climate change is causing rainfall across northern Europe to become more frequent and more intense. Today, Normandy started commemorating the 80th anniversary of the D-Day landings of June 6, 1944, a major sea and air operation that marked the start of the liberation of France and Europe from Nazi Germany.
The words, Freedom, I Write Your Name, lied written on the sand in the Aramancha's Les Bayans Beach as the whole coast remembered the thousands of Allied soldiers who participated in the operation in Normandy. At Vierville sur Mer, a town just above Omaha Beach, one of the American sectors with Utah Beach where U.S. soldiers landed, a reenactment camp was set up with a chance for visitors to see what equipments GIs were using during the Normandy campaign and take a ride in World War II jeeps and armored vehicles. Looking over the beach, a handful of members of the Virginia National Guard 29th Infantry Division gazed upon the beach their elders stormed some 80 years ago. World leaders and veterans on Thursday will mark the 80th anniversary of the D-Day landings in different commemorations along the coast. President Cyril Ramaphosa praised South Africa's election process, even though his once dominant ANC party lost its majority for the first time. Parties have two weeks to hash out a deal and choose a president. We have held another successful election that has been free, fair, credible, and peaceful. The ANC had its worst election showing since it came to power 30 years ago, ending white minority rule. It's Africa's oldest liberation movement, once led by Nelson Mandela. With South Africans angry over joblessness, inequality, and rolling blackouts, support for the party fell to 40.2% from 57.5% in 2019. Official results showed the ANC won 159 seats in the 400-seat parliament, down from 230 in the previous assembly. That means it must now share power, likely with a major political rival, in order to keep it. It's an unprecedented prospect in South Africa's post-apartheid history. Parties now have two weeks to hash out a deal before a new parliament sits to choose a president. The president would likely still come from the ANC as it remains the biggest force. Its poor showing has fueled speculation that Ramaphosa's days might be numbered, but the ANC has called that idea a no-go. The Democratic Alliance, or DA, is the main opposition party. It's white-led, pro-business, and received nearly 22% of the vote. Leader John Steenhazen said the party has appointed a negotiating team for coalition talks. Other competitors include MK, a new party led by former President Jacob Zuma, which took 14.6% of the vote. The prospect of the ANC teaming up with either of those two parties has rattled South Africa's business community and global investors, who would prefer a coalition that brings in the DA. New frontiers were breached in the space field as we finally get more connection to the dark side of Earth's only natural satellite. China landed an uncrewed spacecraft on the far side of the moon, overcoming a key hurdle in its landmark mission to retrieve the world's first rock and soil samples from the dark lunar hemisphere. The successful mission elevates China's space power status in a global rush to the moon and puts it a step closer to retrieving the world's first rock and soil samples from the dark lunar hemisphere. Countries, including the United States, are hoping to exploit lunar minerals to sustain long-term astronaut missions and moon bases within the next decade. The landing is China's second on the far side of the moon, a region no other country has reached. If all goes as planned, the Chang'e 6 crafts mission will provide China with a pristine record of the moon's 4.5 billion year history and yield new clues on the solar system's formation. It will also allow for an unprecedented comparison between the dark, unexplored region with the moon's better understood Earth-facing side. The side of the moon perpetually facing away from the Earth is dotted with deep, dark craters, making communications and robotic landing operations more difficult. Chang'e 6 marks the world's third lunar landing this year. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news right after this. Welcome back. 
We have some updates for you on the T20 World Cup that kicked off with the US and Canada teams facing off on the 1st of June. Ten years on from their ICC T20 World Cup winning campaign, led by an outgoing golden generation, Sri Lanka's next crop of cricketers find themselves with a chance to write their names in history by bringing the country another trophy, as the team's match with South Africa began just a short while ago. Here are some updates on the game. With 10 overs gone, South Africa could hardly have dreamt things would have gone this well. For Sri Lanka, well, it's the opposite. Wanindu Hasaranga's Sri Lanka won the toss and opted to bat first against Aidan Markham's South Africa. Hasaranga stumped the second ball and Maharaj bowled Samara Wickrama with the next delivery. Batman dismissed Nisanka with his first delivery and Kaminder caught off Nocher. And Maharaj says out to Hasaranga, the promotion misfired. Sri Lanka's skipper gives a needless charge against Maharaj's loopy delivery and misses it altogether. A bit of extra bounce and De Kock recovers well to flick the balls down. Maharaj says out to Sadira as well. Two and two for Maharaj. Samara Vikrama rocks back to cuff but the ball slides past the inside edge onto the off stump as his body falls back. Maharaj is pumped up and why wouldn't he be? Charita Salanka plays out the hat-trick delivery for two runs and follows up with a single. Nocha, meanwhile, darts in another yoker and Kusal digs it out. It's a short ball and Kusal mistimes another pull towards mid-wicket, falling in no man's land. Nocha rolls in a slower delivery outside the off stump and Kusal dabs it short third for a single. Well, that is all the stories we have to report to you tonight on World News. Tune in again tomorrow for more key updates from across the globe. I will join you once again in just a moment with the nightly business report. Thank you for joining. Good night.